Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe by Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform. I'm Larry Bishop, and you're listening to The World is Wrong Podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about Bewitched. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome to The World is Wrong, an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists. The world is wrong about. I'm one of your hosts, and my name is Andros Jones. And I'm another host, Brian Connolly. And we are putting our toe into the Nicole Kidman filmography. We hope you listen to our uh, introductory episode to this month of celebration of the work of Nicole Kidman. And today we're exploring what is probably her most beloved and highly <laughs> regarded film. What is it, Brian? Wait, Bewitched from 2005. Uh, Wait a minute. This, I think you're misleading the audience here. Um, sorry. If anyone thought we were going to be talking about the hours, I'm sorry. Well, you know, that people like that movie. We're, like, our podcast, yeah, that's what I mean. We're yeah. we're trying to, you know, we're we're not just saying that Nicole Kidman is underrated in her own way, but we're also going to go through four movies this month that we feel don't quite get the recognition that she that they deserve. That like these are these are four of the better. Uh, I want to say better because we've been seeing a lot of good Nicole Kidman movies, but these are four really good movies that nobody wants to pay attention to or they hate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even people who love Nicole Kidman have some very, uh, I would say, uninformed and prejudiced attitudes towards this film. Yes. Let's crinkle our noses and summon up a <laughs> clip, okay? And Clara, please pick up the phone. Something terrible is happening. Mm-hmm. Something terrible is happening. Oh, I know, I know. It, I, it wasn't supposed you to. You should happen. never, ever get involved with an actor. I'm not involved with him. I, I don't think I... Which is on her? What? <laughs> I'm just being Endora. Oh. Isabel, actors look normal. Sometimes better than normal, but deep down, there is no deep down. Now, I thought you were safe. He loathed you. What on earth happened? A little witchcraft, I suspect. Even though we weren't going to do it, were we, darling? No. I'm Nigel Bigelow. I'm Isabel's father. How do you do? Oh, Daddy. We talked about this, remember? I'm... I know who you are. I've seen everything you've ever done. Lizzie Strata in Florence, Blythe Spirit in New York, and you're in Dora. It's a marvel. It comes so easily, really. Really? Oh, yes, because I am a witch. So, uh, it might be easy to say uh, this movie is uh, loosely, not loosely, based on the late 60s television show Bewitched. But there's a lot of people listening to this, hopefully under the age of 40, and maybe they don't know what the heck we're talking about. With, <laughs> Like, Andres, you grew up watching Bewitched, like in reruns, like me, right? Like, it was on TV oh, all yeah. the damn time. Like, all, all the, time. the time. I don't think it is anymore. I think that's it's too old now. But that was like a Nick at Night staple, or even just like a... Uh, just like syndication on network TV. Like, I remember Even like, pre-Nick at Night. Yeah, just like during the day, you'd have I Dream a Genie, Gilligan's Island... Bewitched, Brady Bunch, like that whole kind of mid to yep. late 60s sort of uh, shows. And I loved it. And so when this movie came out, people were like, is this going to be the show? What's it going on? Well, actually, they took a very kind of post Charlie Kaufman meta version of it. And the plot of this movie is them making the show a new version of Bewitched. And you start, you fa- basically, you have Will Ferrell as Jack Wyatt, not Jack White. And he's sort of this, was a big star in these big movies. Uh, they show a bunch of trailers in the movie for the movies he's in. They're very much like, they kind of remind me of like the stuff Ben Stiller's character did in like Tropic Thunder. Like big, bloated, ridiculous mix of like Hollywood 
uh, big budget movies and sort of like give me an Oscar please movies and then sometimes an amalgamation of both. And his last movie tanked and now he's been demoted in his mind to being in the new version of Bewitched. Uh, which his uh, agent, Richie, played by the great Jason Schwartzman, is kind of pushing for him to be the star of Bewitched, even though Bewitched is about a female witch named Samantha, and her husband Darren is sort of secondary. But he's like, no, no, Jack White as Darren is the star of Bewitched. And so Will Ferrell was pushing to be the star of Bewitched, and so he doesn't want a big star to play Samantha. He's just going to find a nobody to make sure, so just to make sure that he gets all the accolades uh, for the new Bewitched. And so, by chance, he runs into a beautiful, uh, very fascinating woman uh, named Isabel, played by the great Nicole Kidman. And he sees her wiggle her nose, like through a shelf. I think they're at like a library or something. And he's looking through the shelf and he sees her wiggle her nose on the other side of the thing. He just sees her nose and he's like, that's 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 the nose. That's the Samantha nose from Bewitched. We gotta get this lady. And he, through circumstances, convinces her to be on the show. But, unbeknownst to him, but known to the audience, she is an actual witch. Isabel is a witch. And she tells her father, Nigel, played by the great Michael Caine, uh, that she doesn't want to do witchy things anymore. She can very easily snap her fingers and things appear, things happen but she wants to just be normal, maybe fall in love. Um, so she goes against her father's wishes to be in the normal world and even further against his wishes by starring in a big television show. Um, while they make the show, there's, uh, they, they, we, we are reminded of many characters from the original Bewitched show, uh, such as um, Endora, Played by the great Shirley MacLaine in this movie, which is brilliant casting. Oh, so good. <laughs> we get uh, some Uncle Arthur, played by Steve Carell, doing his best Paul Lind impersonation. Uh, oh, and, uh, Sammy! <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the, this movie's full of just lots of little cameos. You also get a Stephen Colbert. You, uh, you get uh, David Alan Greer. Uh, you have Kristen Chenoweth. Uh, as sort of the Nicole Kimmons friend, which is also a great little reference to Wicked, which is the Broadway show that kind of made Kristen Chenoweth a big star. Uh, and we also get lots of little, for fans of the show, Bewitched, you got lots of little references, little jokes. It's kind of like a big thing to unpack. And it's all within the confinement of a great, delightful, very clever Nora Ephron screenplay, Nora Ephron, which she wrote with her sister, and also directed by Nora Ephron. So it also kind of plays on elements of uh, romantic comedy, rom-coms that uh, Nora Ephron kind of started that genre in a way and made it a big deal with When Harry Met Sally, Sleep is in Seattle, You've Got Mail. And this is sort of like a version of those sort of movies in a way, but with this crazy magical fantasy element that Bewitched brings to it. So then the movie, so the movie goes along and there's lots of fun scenes of, her doing kind of witchy uh, magic stuff, fucking with Will Ferrell, whose character, like the great Will Ferrell characters and like Anchorman and whatever, has this big ego that needs to be busted so that the two main characters can fall in love, not just on the show Bewitched, but in the real life of this movie. Uh, that's the basic plot. There's so much more. It's very funny. It's very good. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I love the film, and I want to know how you think... The world is wrong about it. Uh, well, I mean, it's a, this is more like, I think there are two answers for, you know, because of that we're doing this month. One is the Nicole Kimmon angle of like, yeah, you think she's this great Oscar winning actress, but she's also really charming as hell and hilarious and great in just a nice Hollywood, comfortable Hollywood comedy such as this. And she's really good. She's really funny. She like, it, this is not her, you know, just like, uh, going beneath her and making some crap to make money. She's still really good, really interesting, doing a character here. It's kind of playing like a maybe part of this meta of this movie. She's sort of tapping into like a Meg Ryan sort of like vibe that you get you would expect from a Nora Ephron movie, which is not how Nor Nicole Kimmon normally acts. But then on top of that, this movie is very hated 
by audiences and critics alike. It's got a very low rating. Critics thought it was un... That, that, that thing we hate when people are like, it's just not funny. It's not funny. So many reviews of what an unfunny movie. And I think this came out at the time when people were getting Will Ferrell fatigue. Like, we, this is post... Elf and post Anchorman, and I think he was just doing so many movies that maybe people were just tired of it. And also, this is like post we've already done Charlie's Angels and The Mod Squad, and like all these 60s shows being turned into movies. And I think by the time they got to which people were just over it and didn't really give it a chance, I think most people didn't watch it and just thought that looks stupid, I'm done. And they are all wrong. This movie is great. This movie is really, really funny. Like, I laughed so hard throughout the entire movie. And it also kind of taps into sort of the other movies we've talked about in a way. Like, there's some, there's something about that kind of indie meets big Hollywood quirky sort of thing going on in this movie that's not normally in big movies. So I think there's just a lot of interesting things here that no one has ever tried to give a chance to. Well, I'm, I'm looking at, it, at uh, Will Ferrell's... IMDb. In 2005, he was in six films. So you can understand why people <laughs> might be like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> now, we need to let people behind the curtain a little bit, because you said like people, maybe people didn't see this or they didn't like it. Originally, for this episode, we were going to do uh, the Nicole Kid, the other Nicole Kidman reboot of a uh, classic bit of IP, which is the Stepford Wives. Yeah. And I watched it and was just like, oh, I hate this movie. <laughs> and you were very nice about being like, OK, well, I don't want to do that. And I was like, but you before you had told me that you didn't like Bewitched. And I, yeah. I said, well, let's do one where you talk about how great Stepford Wives is and I'll talk about how great Bewitched is. Yeah. And then you watched Bewitched and you got in touch with him and be like, I don't think I saw this movie. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's I, I think maybe like with other people, I saw maybe the trailer and was like, no, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then over the years, I just in my mind was like, yeah, I must have watched that. It was such forgettable trash. And then watching it, I was like, I definitely didn't see this movie because this is really, really funny. And it's not like my my taste in humor has changed. Like, this is the kind of movie I would have found very funny in 2005 when it came out. So I definitely f am guilty of what everyone else was, of just sort of dismissing this movie immediately. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, you know, on our Nicole Kidman uh, episode, the other one that's out right now, you'll hear me talk about Stepford Wives. And there's just definitely something, there's like, the, it was an interesting period where Nicole Kidman was doing these sort of like big comedies and being very good in them and uh i'm just excited to talk about this movie for you and i thank you for kind of making me watch it because <laughs> i would have never known how great this movie is i feel like there's a that's sort of like a a division of big movies where there's all this energy that's put into them there's big stars there's a big budget there's a big campaign and then it bombs and then people have the impression that they have seen it yeah. I think probably many, many more. I Probably more people think they've seen this movie than actually have. Yeah. It's possible. Well, let's get into it. I think, I feel like, first of all, I love it. I, that's clear. We don't need to talk about how much I love it. We'll, we'll go do that going throughout. But <laughs> we need to, I think we need to talk a little bit about Bewitched, the series. And I also want to do a little connection with our Johnny Cool yeah. episode because we devoted a, a fair amount of time recently to discussing Elizabeth Montgomery in that film and yeah. how that led to Bewitched. And so we're back in the land of Bewitched again. And in <laughs> listening to some podcasts that have unpacked this film, it's really surprising how many people will talk about this film and be like, what, how does it relate to that series? I've never seen it. And <laughs> it's essential. Like It's kind of impossible. The idea of watching this movie and not knowing the original series. Yeah. Is I mean, like, yeah, it must be. It must be a very strange experience. I like, imagine it's a very strange experience. I mean, maybe that's maybe it doesn't work for people who haven't seen the show. When the people when the other people that you've heard talk about it who haven't seen the show, do they not like it? Do you think it's keeping them from liking it? Well, yeah, they're like, why is 
<laughs> I remember they, they were talking about like, so at the beginning of the movie, she comes and she steals someone's house. And then uh, what's what the the lady with the the bag full of doorknobs <laughs> yeah. and who's this offensive gay character? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, you know, no, you just, you need to see it's not that's Paul Lynn. That's a great Paul Lynn impression. He's not doing a he's not doing some sort of cliched mawkish character. He he's doing a, a an impression of a guy who was like that. In who real was life, like, that's how Paul yeah, Lynn was. He was he's the blueprint. <laughs> You know, maybe it's like seeing being John Malkovich and not knowing who John Malkovich is. <laughs> it's like, yeah, what's this movie? Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> so, like in this, de- like yeah, like this movie definitely exists in that kind of post Tarantino, you know, like post Charlie Kaufman. Like it's meta and referential, and like it's entertaining, but it's definitely going to be much more rewarding if you watch the original show. Yeah, I feel like this pays off. Like you mentioned Charlie's Angels. I feel like this pays off on an appreciation of Bewitched a lot better than Charlie's Angels or maybe other reboots like Starsky and Hutch or other things like that. Yeah. They, they, it does a better job. I mean, Nora Ephron is a real, uh, a real crafty artist yeah. who knows her stuff. And I feel like it's... Yeah, I feel like she does just as good a job as anyone could do with this material and brings a lot of really interesting, fun stuff to it. Mm-hmm. In in doing the research for this, I went back and watched... They show it in the movie. There's this opening to the pilot of Bewitched that shows Darren and Samantha meeting each other. Once upon a time, there was a typical American girl who happened to bump into a typical red-blooded American boy. And then it shows, I don't know which, I guess it's Dick York. He's the first Dick, right? That seems right. Right. Uh, I should get that right before we before we do a whole episode. I know his first name my is Dick's Dick. wrong. <laughs> yeah. That I know. It's either Dick York or Dick Sargent. Which one? That even comes back. That's like, There's some really, really clever stuff that's built into the script. But it's funny to me that that, black and white opening with them meeting is very much like Johnny cool. Like I watched that and I'm like, what if that was Henry Silva? It looks like it's, it's <laughs> shot by the same guy. It's the same actress and they have a similar sort of meet cute where they don't really know what's going on. <laughs> so there was just something I feel like, again, if you like this and you like Bewitched, you got to go back and check out Johnny Cool. I just feel like it's such... It's, <laughs> Does the show like start the, with Dick Sargent punching somebody in the stomach and then Samantha being like, ooh, I like that guy? <laughs> no, it is Dick York. It starts with... <laughs> oh, it's Dick it's York. Dick York okay. from 1964 to 1969. So if you don't know, in the series, they replaced her husband, who was played by Dick York from 1964 to 1969, by the actor Dick Sargent, who played it from 1969 to 1972. And I'll tell you, I had a I had a weird experience when I was young, is that I was convinced that I saw Dick Sargent in a supermarket in Olympia when I was a kid. Maybe. I don't think it really happened, but it's Maybe. possible. It's possible. People drive the five. And the thing is, both those guys look similar enough that it's like that's how they tried to pull off that they replaced the guy. <laughs> So, Such a weird thing. Yeah. It's like, and you wonder why that, ha- I don't know the story as to why did they replace the Darrens. It's not like one of them died. It just, maybe they didn't like <laughs> Dick York and they brought it. And we got to make sure his name is Dick. So that way no one will know the difference. <laughs> and interestingly, considering all of the JFK stuff that we discussed in Johnny Cool, I was just looking on Wikipedia and one of the weird synchronicities about Bewitched is that they started rehearsals for the pilot on November 22nd, 1963. <laughs> so a month after the less than a month after the release of Johnny Cool, the director of Johnny Cool and the star have already pitched have used that film to pitch and sell this series and they start they start filming on that day. Uh, wow. Also, interestingly, if you check out any of the versions of the show that had any kind of voiceover, there was an uncredited performance by Jose Ferrer. And when the boy 
found the girl attractive, desirable, irresistible, he did what any red-blooded American boy would do. He asked her to marry him. So if you recognize oh, wow. that voice. Interesting. So, a lot okay. of star power. A lot of, yeah. a lot of energy behind Bewitched. You almo- it almost feels like there might be something supernatural about it. I mean, uh, <laughs> how do you get an Academy Award-winning actor like Jose Ferrer to be an uncredited narrator in your goofy TV show about a witch? And then this movie has three Academy Award winners in it with Michael Caine, Shirley MacLaine, and Nicole Kidman. That, you know, that's some real star power. And, man, like, when Shirley MacLaine showed up in this movie playing the actress, playing Endora, I was like, oh, my God, that's so perfect, and I can't believe they got her to do this. <laughs> that was, that was to me, the most exciting part of the first watch of this movie. It was just like, that is so brilliant. And, like, that's a thing that you would joke about, but you're like, oh, but she would never do that. And then she totally does and does an amazing job. Oh, she's great. <laughs> Playing the character that was originally given to us by Agnes Moorhead of uh, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater fame. Yeah. And also a great actress. Probably the great actress in that, the great actor in that whole series. Yeah. Agnes Moorhead. Uh, no offense to Paul Lynn or <laughs> Elizabeth Montgomery or the two dicks. Okay, well, uh, I also wanted to point out that there is also a, a little rhyming in that the the situation that Will Ferrell finds himself in in this movie, that his character finds him in, himself in at the beginning of this movie, is pretty is similar to the situation that Chris Rock is in at the beginning of Top Five and yeah. the relationship. But I sort of I was watching it and thinking about how the relationship between Will Ferrell and Jason Schwartzman also is analogous to Chris Rock's relationship with Kevin Hart, who plays his agent in, (laughs) you can almost put the, like the scenes of the agent convincing him, Oh, you're, (laughs) you're failing. You need to start doing this other thing in this, in top five, it's the, the reality marriage. And in this, it's the, the show, but it's the same thing. It's like, you need to hitch your wagon to something. that's a little bit lower class Mm -hmm. than you think you are. That's, where a woman is out front and you get to be the second banana. And I think that also kind of reminds me of back to Ben Stiller, Tropic Thunder with Matthew McConaughey as his agent. Yeah. And there, like, there's such a weird, there was a trope in the early aughts in, in LA for whatever reason we wanted to see people with earpieces walking around an office, just like making demands <laughs> for their actors. Like that was a window of Hollywood that audiences were, they, or they thought audiences were interested in is like, let's put a really good actor in or a comedian as this person's agent. And they're going to say ridiculous things. And that's the source of comedy. Like, okay. <laughs> Which again is like that Ben Stiller character from the Ben Stiller show where he's sort of like the ridiculous schmoozy. Like, I forget what the character is where he's like in the office, always pitching some ridiculous thing to like, making Al Pacino do Beethoven or whatever, you know, like... Hey, let me tell you something. Letterman is out of there, all right? The guy's defected. No, it's history, all right? It's old news. No, you're going to be stuck in the thing without a paddle, looking around saying, you know, why couldn't I help you out? And I'm telling you, these guys are here with a lifeboat. It's Willie Tyler and Lester. These guys can host a show. Yes, one's a dummy, one's a ventriloquist, but that doesn't mean that they can't ask questions at the same time, too. It's great. We'll sit with it. Okay. All right. You know what I'm talking... Remember that character? That's another, like... It seems Mm -hmm. like a very Ben Stiller character of like, I'm going to be this Hollywood schmo who's just going to be throwing out insane, ridiculous ideas that, you know, that maybe land with this person who I'm trying to fix their career. And that's just like a source of comedy. And Jason Schwartzman is so funny in this movie. He's, that's such a good, like, it's rare that you see him play kind of like this sort of jerky character. Usually he's more like the nice guy that someone's being a jerk to. But in this, he plays like just a really good heel (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah coming off of i heart huckabees where which is i feel like if you like the feeling of i heart huckabees then bewitched it should be you know the dessert of that meal <laughs> it has that kind of built-in quirkiness to like the way the tone the music like who did the music for this because it's not john brian it's not john brian so. but you know whoever it was got the notes could you make it kind of john brian-y it is it is kind of perfect how much this movie ties in with so many things we've just did by total rando chance 
It's amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the music on that was composed by a fellow named George Fenton, who mm. did music for Groundhog Day. Uh, lots. He's been doing stuff since the early 70s. So a guy who's been around forever making music for films and at this point someone said hey can you do that john bryan thing and he was like yeah i can do that john bryan thing in my sleep and he and he did no he didn't really give the full genius of the john bryan thing but if you wanted to do an impression he did a, a nice impression yeah. so uh, there's one other point that i want to touch on before we dive into just unpacking the film and it has to do with what was it in our episode about Temptation, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor, I mentioned the Douglas Sirk film, Slightly French, and this film feels a lot like that. It's again, it's a guy who is stuck in the production, who goes out and finds someone who he thinks he can control, and then that person becomes a star, and he has to become subservient to her and get how great she is. It's very, very similar. It almost made... It, it, I don't, I'm not saying that Nora Ephron had seen that film, but if she had seen that film, I wouldn't be surprised because there's yeah. a lot of similarities. So now let's, uh, let's unpack this movie, shall we? Yeah. It starts off with a song from a band called Persephone's Bees and the song City of Love. And they're actually a band that I was kind of aware of at the time. Or I just, I sort of become aware of them through the indie scene a year before that. So when I did see this movie and that song jumped out of it, I was like, it was one of those moments where like you see a friend in a movie or you hear a, you know, there's something that you thought was from your neighborhood and all of a sudden it's on a billboard. <laughs> and I love the music. I love the song. And the I just the idea of Persephone's Bees, you're already getting this sort of witchy thing going on with Persephone and that myth and how that speaks to the, you know, this sort of feminist empowerment, Wiccan, go girl kind of vibe that mm -hmm. you just, you kick off this movie with, yeah. which I loved. I was right. So basically as soon as the film, the music kicks in, I was right there with it. That's great. <laughs> so uh, how long were you watching this movie before you realized, holy shit, this is, this isn't. Uh, this is good. I like this. Uh, I'm trying to. It's like I think it was when Will Will Ferrell demands there to be a cake day. I think it's that whole. That's. I think it's that scene when he. It's this. It's the pitch scene where he's like he sits down with Stephen Colbert and uh, my my brain is frozen on who the other person is, and it's them talking to Will Ferrell and his agent played by Jason Schwartzman and Will Ferrell's at first just being like great whatever you want like i'll yeah i'll be daring and bewitched and then jason schwartz being like no push harder like make your crazy demands like be crazy like you're the star you're the star and will ferrell starts making <laughs> tapping into his you know what we love about will ferrell when he gets into this over exuberance and just sort of like yelling crazy things and he yells about a cake day and he wants there to be cake every day and then when I, and that's when i started being like okay this is really really good and really funny and then when and then maybe it's like 20 minutes in when they're doing the tryouts of Nicole Kim and showing everybody her nose wiggle. And it keeps cutting to groups of people just like being so pumped and excited about watching her nose wiggle. And Jason Schwartzman reaction to it is so funny because he seems so excited and happy to see Nicole Kim and wiggle her nose. And it's like at that point, I was like, oh, OK, I get I get what this comedy's doing. Like they get the joke. They like we're all in on the same joke. Like this is not some crap. Like trying to make a show into a movie. Like this is a very, very smart, very self-aware, very funny movie. Yeah, for me, it was the. So there's this, this. How do I describe it? So at the beginning of the movie, Nicole Kidman arrives, and quote steals this house she she uses her magic to get this house and then she goes off to bed bath and beyond <laughs> to become a human woman this film the way this film uses product placement to communicate this weird sort of aspirational non-feminist feminism like consumer feminism kind yeah. of thing is really i just 
I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's very effective. And <laughs> yeah. the way it looks, just the colors of it, the way it just it really fits with the film. Uh, yeah. With, and I and I so I think there's an intelligence to it that I appreciate. But there's a great scene. At, uh, there's, so Michael Caine shows up as her father in this scene and they're talking about how she wants to be a real woman. And he's like, why would you want to do that when you can be a witch? Everyone, every woman wants to be a witch and you get to be one. He's like, she's like, I, I want to argue about painting my kitchen. That's like her her touchstone of what it is to be a human woman is to argue about to worry about what you're going to how you're going to paint your kitchen but there's a wonderful moment where they come out and it's raining and he uses his magic to get an umbrella and oh nora oh nora efron <laughs> I like it. I like a dirty woman. <laughs> a dirty smart woman. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Man, it's like and I think this movie like not is not as meta about Bewitched, but it really is tapping into that Nora Ephron sort of like all the stuff that she things that have become obvious by the time this movie came out of, of rom rom coms. And tangent for a second. Another reason why people are wrong about this movie, so many people like to shit on Nora Ephron for whatever goddamn reason. Maybe because she made movies that were too successful in people's eyes and that makes you less than for whatever reason. But like, Or maybe like... it's the same problems that people have with Jill that we talked about before. Maybe there's something about a funny, successful, smart Jewish woman that uh, some people like to... Yeah, on. I mean, but like this... Like she is very good at her job and always has been. Like really she, like, good. Like I went back and watched Heartburn this week, oh. and man, that is also just such a clever, funny, dramatic, well written, well acted, amazing movie. And then I also did redid uh, When Harry Met Sally, which is the same thing. It's just like it's so there's something so human about the way she writes people, but at the mm -hmm. same time, every word that comes out of everyone's mouth is so funny, like funnier than normal people. But so yeah. it's like you have like these really funny, great, clever dialogue, but with these characters that are very emotive and like these relationships that feel very genuine. And like you might think Jack Nicholson singing while eating pizza is ridiculous, but in the context of Heartburn, it just makes sense. And that scene makes sense. And and it's the same thing with this movie. This movie never seems like it's it seems like a movie that could totally go off the rails, but yep. it but it doesn't. Like it plays it does the dance and it totally works. If like, we're going to reference the show and be like a romantic comedy and have these really good actors in it. And ever, it's like a good time, but it's not stupid. And like, I really like, like, like her going to bed, bath and beyond. It's like, that seems silly, but it's also like, like you said, it's kind of tapping into this weird, like movie version of like, or just sort of like, this is how you, like, it kind of reminds me of like Adam Sandler stuff of like how you work in your product placement and it seems ridiculous. Yep. But at the same time, there are people that go to Bed Bath & Beyond and think that's going to make their lives better or change because they're getting a whole new bed set and bed towels, <laughs> you know? So it's, 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 I love, and I, I think that like Nora Ephron was the right person to do this. And what's interesting is originally it was going to be Penny Marshall. The other female director that a lot of people like to not be nice about <laughs> occasionally. So it's like, it's, I think that if, if it wasn't Penny Marshall, I'm glad that it was Nora Ephron making this movie. It's one of those things where it might have, if I, if Penny Marshall had made this movie, I might have liked it, but I wouldn't want to lose. And having seen this movie, I can't imagine anyone else doing it because the touch, it just has this light touch throughout that works. Yeah. As a writer, she and Delia Efron wrote a great script. And then as a director, she just hit every note so lightly. And even though, I mean, there's sort of over the top kind of stuff in it throughout, but it never feels like you can kind of feel like the show that they're making is a dumb show. <laughs> yeah. And the movie that they're making about making this dumb show is really smart. Yeah. And that's that sort of Charlie Kaufman thing except even like charlie kaufman couldn't do this he definitely i'm so glad charlie kaufman did well he would have made a much movie. more bitter sarcastic it would have been all about cut, like it would have been all about replacing the dick it would not <laughs> it would not it it this needed to be directed by a woman and it needed to be directed by that woman i think yeah. Nora yeah. efron 
just brings you, you know her her story she comes from this film family that produced or that wrote and directed several of the Hepburn Tracy films from the 50s I think and so she's just like you kind of get that she has that quality that maybe a Sofia Coppola has of just like I've been in this so long that the the language of film is my personal language mm-hmm. right um so and, I think, and some people might look at that as like oh that is like so like not a world you can connect to like like what a weird like these people are brats who just were spoiled and like didn't grow up but like i think what she adds to this and i think what i say think sophia coppola adds to some of her movies is like having that growing up with that you do get a much more human view a less sarcastic view of how to make movies like it is more like this is the job that these people have in your lives, your whole lives. This is what they they went to work, you know? And this movie also showcases like a great cast of who just plays the crew of Bewitched, like going into like all the people who make the props and like the director and like kind of shining a light on some of the people you normally don't see when they, t- when they do things about movies. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, let's, let's get back to the film. Uh, there, so I can't, I'm not going to talk about the other podcast that, I'm not going to give them a shout out because I'm going to be I'm sort of responding to things they got wrong in this. <laughs> but this podcast I listened to, one of the things they were talking about, the meat cute, where Will Ferrell discovers Nicole Kidman in uh, I don't know if you if you know L.A. Uh, that's a bookstore called Book Soup that is in a lot of movies. You will recognize it from lots of movies and TV shows, and. One of the complaints was like, it just seems really stalkery. He's looking through that and he's just like staring at her nose. Like, what's up with that? What's just this obsession with her nose? I'm like, you need to watch the original series, people. This is, of course, yes, he objectified her nose. <laughs> the whole, that's what Bewitched does. You know, it's, it's a it's big not creepy. nose fetish show that Bewitched. Uh... <laughs> it's not creepy, it's adorable. Anyway. <laughs> And there, you, you left out there's a really a really fun little bit of world building the show did is that not only is Samantha Isabel or is Isabel played by Nicole Kidman, who is going to play Samantha, deciding to be in a show, which is kind of funny that like she just her slumming like the thing is she just wants to be a normal person and Will Ferrell sort of pushes her into being a TV star, which is something that everyone in L.A., wants to be and this is Nora Ephron's world of what it is to slum it as a witch to become (laughs) a tv star but one of the fun things is that she's like oh bewitched I my parents didn't let me watch that this was like it's not just that she's in this show it's a show that she wasn't allowed to watch as a kid because little witches aren't allowed to watch this sort of like witch face it's like watching Amos and Andy (laughs) witch face yeah, a wit- <laughs> offensive stereotypes of witches Which, for yeah. humans. And so there's just something that's funny about that for her. Like she's yeah. she's sort of, it's this rebellion against her father. <laughs> and it's funny, like w- watching this movie, I, I made a note saying like, man, witches are kind of like rich people. They're just sort of lazy and they want things now and they don't want to work and they just wave their hand and fix their house up. And then immediately after I made that note, Will Ferrell or the char- his character of Jack promises her like you'll be you won't have to do anything you'll be like you'll be rich you'll be fake you get anything you want you snap your fingers and things will just happen and she's like well I already do that like I don't want that <laughs> yes and uh, there's some really just there's just some really nice montages I love the 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 music in this film is great the and she was mm-hmm. cue. With the talk with the Talking Heads is uh, song is is great, and that leads into the the scene you were talking about where she's wiggling her nose and improving <laughs> with Will Ferrell, and everyone's just loving it. I have a couple things later in the film that I want to talk about, but are there are there moments? As we as um, we progress through this, I you think wanna dig a into? lot of people assume this was a, one of those not as funny as other Will Ferrell Will Ferrell movies, but he really has so many good bits in this, and this movie really plays to his strengths very well. And like the part where um, 
Nicole Kidman or where uh, Isabel is making him say, where's my dog over and over again. And he's saying it in different languages and different uh, tones. And that is just a, a classic Will Ferrell bit where it's just him doing these different like versions of shouting and different versions of, of feelings. And, and that's really good. That's so good. And just there's something about like the uh, there's something weird. The part where they have the dog where they are, they are, are, can I talk about this scene or is this? Yeah. Is this yeah. before? And I'm going to run this by you. This is something that my wife pointed out. And I'm like, this, that's interesting. So the dog's name is Satchel. And the scene mm-hmm. is them trying to get this dog to run to either Jack or Isabel, basically the mom or the dad. And the mm-hmm. dog is being controlled to kind of steer away by, by witchy power controlled the run away from not not run to the dad but run to the mom satchel is the actual first name of ronan farrow is that scene about mia farrow and woody allen and which kid goes to which parent <laughs> oh wow right like oh is that my wife pointed out because i didn't know ronan farrow's first name was actually satchel and i was like is this a comment on the mia farrow woody allen is there something to that or is that a total coincidence? This is like some oh, weird wow. conspiracy. Oh wow, that's <laughs> what is your that's... thoughts on that? <laughs> or is this some? You know, this is a weird conspiracy going on. Well, here. you know how I am. I love that stuff. So yeah, I'm fully on board with like if I had it, <laughs> if I had the opportunity to go into the afterlife and interview Nora Ephron, I would definitely ask her that question. Like, yeah, what were that, you is, doing there? Is this? And her she'll com- be like, she'll yeah, be like what? Like, are you commenting on the Woody Allen real Mia Farrow thing here? Of come to mom, no, come to dad. No, I'm going to use witch power to make it so you don't come to dad, but come to mom. What yeah. Is, is this, is there, are you saying something? Maybe we're reading too much into this dog joke. <laughs> but... Well, con- considering how much we read into Johnny Cool, I think we're fine. <laughs> so I want to go back because there's a piece we're not explaining. So, uh, so obviously, uh, some, uh, Isabel's uh, Nick, Nicole Kidman's goal is to be a normal human, and the Will Ferrell character's goal is to get an actress to play Samantha that he can control. And he has this reputation, like as uh, you know, just sort of a horn dog douchebag kind of guy. You you kind of get from the other women in the world and the other people who know him that, but. That's not how Nicole Kidman sees him. She sees him as someone she can fall in love with. And every time he says something, like every time he seems pathetic or he needs her, that just, that's like catnip, witch nip for her. Like she just, <laughs> she's like, oh, I just want to be needed like a normal, you know, a normal lady. And so she agrees to do this series, but mostly because she thinks that Jack, played by uh, Will Ferrell, loves her and then at some point she overhears jack uh, jack and jason schwartzman talking about how it's pathetic that she actually has a crush on him and her heart gets broken a little bit and that's when she starts using her witchiness to <laughs> to start to assert herself on the set and the fuck and with that's, uh, will ferrell basically just to ruin his life yeah yeah and that's where this dog thing comes in <laughs> And like, basically she doesn't have any lines. They're really, you know, they're treating her very poorly. And I have to say this, right. This is where I'm going to start bringing in another Nicole Kidman film. So while I was watching Bewitched, I was also deep diving on all of Nicole Kidman's films for our big retrospective episode about this. And it was very hard for me not to watch after seeing Dogville, I kept seeing Dogville in, in there's a dog again, uh, <laughs> thing, the, in this film, like the way that Will Ferrell treats Nicole Kidman in this film is like a much more cinematically benign version of the way Paul Bettany treats her in Dogville. And yeah, I, and it, it both made me really, lo- it made me love this film as sort of like, that it's touching on us on similar dynamics, but it was also a much more pleasant place to be. But, and this might just be in my head because you might watch, I'm sure the first time I watched it, I hadn't seen Dogville and I didn't think about it at all, but now I can't watch it without thinking about that. But maybe that's just because I watched Dogville this week. 
Sort of like Will Ferrell being like Paul Bettany, bringing her into this world, introducing her to all these people, but then everybody sort of taking advantage of her and getting what they want from her. Yeah. You know, like using yeah. her for their own, like whatever they need. Yeah, exactly. And then exactly. Throw, and easily throwing her away when they don't need it anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is when we get into one of my favorite little screenwriting meta moments. So there's a scene where Will Ferrell's character is talking to James Lipton, uh, an inside <laughs> the actor studio thing, and he's taking credit for the nose wiggle. <laughs> and Nicole Kidman's watching it. And immediately one of her friends, maybe it's Kristen Chenoweth, calls him up and is like, did you see this? And yeah, he's a dick. And she's like, what is a dick? And then he, she explains, she learns what a dick is and that and then basically spends a big chunk of the movie doing witchy stuff to really mess with before she was doing witchy stuff to sort of give herself agency in the show but this is when it turns into a revenge thing yeah and she really just starts to mess with Will Ferrell, and she does it in all these different ways, and it gets worse and worse and worse, and then she realizes that this isn't what she wants to do, and she has this power of rewind. That's her That's her big spell, and they use it a couple times. And they rewind right back to that point where she learns what Dick is. And to me, there's this thing, because the whole myth of Bewitched is the replacing yeah. of the Dicks. And doing it again. <laughs> and... and <laughs> I, when when I saw that, it took it, maybe it was on the second or third watch of this film that I saw that, and I was just like, I wanted to stand up and give Nora Ephron like a standing ovation for like, yeah. this. This is just clever screenwriting. You know, yeah. you know that most people are not going to get it, but once you do, you're just so happy that someone is giving that level of thought to yeah. this world that it's Ugh. it's a so smart and like and then you within that you get that great scene of of uh jack wyatt coming in and getting sort of the, the audience score for yeah. the thing and the first time around he's under the spell of love for isabel so he's like i don't care like oh so they hate me she's the star she's great and he goes through this whole thing where it feels like every it feels like the end of like uh Groundhog Day or It's a Wonderful Life where it's like, oh, he's really changed his tune. He's so nice now. He's so full of love. And then post-rewind, we get it again, but we get it with the more classic Will Ferrell, you know, bloated, ego, uh, angry, <laughs> like people are idiots. I'm the star. Like, how dare they not love me? Like, I'm the best. Uh, and it, it, she it, got it, a 99? <laughs> how did she get in? Were they were they on drugs? <laughs> And it's that, right, well, when she's there, right to her face, just like complete yeah. disrespect. And that yeah. scene, that is some good classic Will Ferrell, that scene right there. It's so funny. Like he just can hit into that pretentious, angry actor thing. Uh, and it was great too, go, like seeing him talk to James Lipton because he always did a really good James Lipton on SNL when he would do a parody of Inside the Actors Studios. It was fun to see them together uh, in that scene. Yeah. Well, this is when... We start so we've already talked about Michael Caine playing her father. And we didn't really we, we talked about uh Shirley McLean showing up as Andorra, but the way she shows up is she's an actress cast to play Andorra, and we initially meet her as someone who is sort of an over the top, like an Agnes Moorhead kind of character. Yeah. Like I'm the real actress in this. And so when I come out, I'm going, you know, like they have to tell her, don't acknowledge the audience when you come it's out. When they clap. <laughs> it's, and she's like, I, go away, go away. I'm a, I'm a real, I'm a real star. I'm a, a great lady of the screen. I'm Shirley MacLaine, basically, you know, don't, you don't, I'm slumming it being in this thing. Do go away, get be gone with you. I'm going to do what I want. And, but in that way, it sort of downplays her and makes her look like a little bit of a pathetic cliche of that kind of actress that we have seen over and over again. But this film is much more clever than that, because as it goes on, well, first of all, Michael Caine's character as the father starts to be interested in her. But in a way, like you can tell, he's sort of a playboy. And as that plays out you can see that, you know, it's a spider to the fly kind of situation. Like, 
Michael Caine thinks he's the spider, but no, 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 no. <laughs> he is he is trapped in Endora's web, <laughs> and the 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 wonderful sort of ambiguity of the way that the fact that she is a witch She's also is a revealed. Witch. Yeah. Like, that's the whole thing is that we start to find out that she actually is a witch. She actually is the Endora character. <laughs> and it puts her in this place in this film. The meta place that her character exists in is so ambiguous and it works because we want it to work. Like yeah. it, the film draws our consciousness to demanding that she must be a witch and then she is <laughs> and then it holds the whole thing together in a way but like if you start to like really dig down into that you, you don't want to like just yeah. let's let let this be what it is because it's so wonderful <laughs> and watching the way that she ensnare that she basically plays the mother to Nicole Kidman's character but in the guise of being just an older actress giving advice to a younger actress when in fact she's a witch playing an actress giving advice to a witch playing an actress playing a witch <laughs> it's so wonderful it just oh i just and it's, I, it's I, yeah <laughs> you can see why you say like you, it's sort of like i can't believe that shirley mclean did this but the way it's written i can't imagine shirley mclean could like, she couldn't say no to this. And I wonder, like, who, like, because this is the third movie she's done with Michael Caine now. So I wonder if that was part of the, who pulled who in, or was it just someone who was a fan of the two movies they already did together making a third movie with them? Because they were first together in Gambit by our old friend Ronald Neem mm -hmm. directing Gambit. And that's another one where Michael Caine thinks he's the one in charge, but it actually is Shirley MacLaine's character is the one who's, like, the smarter one. Uh, and so it's kind of playing on Gambit. And then there's also Woman Time 7, which is an amazing movie. And there's Michael Caine and Shirley MacLaine in that too. And it's just like, for some reason, it's just great to see those two actors together. It's like they, their chemistry works. Like in the scenes in this movie, when Michael Caine's trying to be this creepy, suave old guy to like whatever civil servants nearby. <laughs> and then Shirley MacLaine will do some little magic and they will say some really embarrassing, like truthful thing to kind of scare Michael Caine away to back <laughs> into the arms of uh, Shirley MacLaine. Those, those bits are very funny. Hmm. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen, I, I'll be honest. I haven't seen either of those films, so I need to, you should. Women Time seven is great. Cause that's like, that, that's one of those movies. Like Shirley MacLaine, I think is one of those people where some people, I think a lot of people take for granted so it's either like, oh, she was that lady from Terms of Endearment or she was a lady from the apartment. And you don't like think about what range and how great she actually oh, is. And yeah. like in Women Time 7, it's her playing seven different characters. And, and Peter Sellers is in it. And it's so good. It's like that when you watch that movie, it's hard not to be convinced that she is like the Nicole Kidman of the sixties of like, you have such range. You are so smart. You are so good. You're beautiful, but man, you are, you are a brilliant character actor, like as good as any man, but better than, but you just don't get quite the credit for that because you have such a big star persona around you. Cause you're Shirley MacLaine or whatever, but yeah, check out woman time seven, man, that movie is so funny and it's so good. I've and never G even heard of it. That's, yeah, and, that's and, crazy. And Gambit's great, too. Gambit's just a fun time, and it's just like, you know, her and Michael Caine like, playing off each other uh, brilliantly. Um, well, we might need to do one of these months for Shirley MacLaine sometime. Because <laughs> and do be witched certainly... again. <laughs> I think we could leave that one out, but I'd love to do... You know, one of the first ones that I, uh, I wanted, the films I wanted to do for this was Some Came Running, and you were like, the world isn't wrong about that. People already love that film. People love but... that movie. <laughs> I don't hear anyone talk enough about how great I think Shirley MacLaine's performance in that is it's like James Dean and Rubble Without a Cause to me, like just like a raw charismatic nerve. Well, let's come back to the to the film here because, oh, there was one funny moment. So when when Will Ferrell's under the the love spell and Samantha or Nicole Kidman says, I you know, I don't even have a job. And he's like. You don't have a job? Like, it's his whole thing. is you don't have lines, you give her lines. Give her, you know, uh, give her everything. And he, he says, make this woman the CEO of a major corporation. And I was like, is that a Stepford jab? I think that might be a Stepford Wives <laughs> jab. Because it's very close. Um, was this before or after Stepford Wives? Stepford Wives is 2004, so the year before this. 
Yeah, so this could very well, that could very well be a Stepford Wives jab because she does play the CEO of a major corporation and that's one of the weird <laughs> things that they added to that film that I feel like throws the balance off from the, what the Stepford Wives is about. But we won't go into that because we're, you know, we're not, we're here to, we're here to praise Bewitched, not slag Stepford Wives. I think, uh, so on. I think Nicole Kidman, let's talk about Nicole Kidman's performance for a second. And yeah. her, her character of Isabel. It's interesting because she plays definitely this sort of like fish out of water, innocent, but she never seems stupid. Like this could totally have been played as like a total idiot, like stupid. It could be more like Will Ferrell in Elf, you know, like showing mm -hmm. up to New York and being like, I don't know what's going on. I'm broken because I'm not from this world. And that's where the jokes come from. And this movie never seems mean towards the character of Isabel. It's like the jokes are never like, ah, she's so stupid. She doesn't know. And there's something like the, the way, the way that the innocence that Nicole Kimmon plays this character isn't creepy and it isn't dumbed down. There's something like almost alien uh, about the way she, like it's how she is. And there's like, it's just interesting how she plays a character that doesn't know. Th she's not stupid. She just doesn't know how this world works that she has shown up in basically. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about in our big Nicole Kidman retrospective was the the wig work, like that she wears wigs in every movie. And now knowing that I watched the I kind of I figure that's where the character starts for her. And this wig is. Wow. I mean, it's Samantha. It's Meg Ryan. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it's magical and sort of like girl next door, -y, but no girl next door would ever have this hair like this. Like it's <laughs> completely magical hair. And it's it's wild to think about Nicole Kidman, because if another actress was playing this role, you'd think like, say, Meg Ryan. You feel like when like she's like, oh, well, this she's playing. This is who this is who Meg Ryan is. This is what Meg Ryan's like. But Nicole Kidman shapeshifts so much and so much of what we know her as on film is someone who seems more alien, more detached, more strange or overwrought, you know, or, you know, in distress. Mm -hmm. And so the lightness and the ease of this performance, which is definitely a performance. It's not like, OK, here's Show Nicole up. Kidman. Yeah. Just showing up and just, okay. Just record you know. and here's the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, like, I feel like this is as much of a creation as oh, yeah. her role in The Paperboy or her role in Birth. Like, yeah. she's, this is her playing a character that is, you know, is like a, t like, yeah, it's a three-dimensional version of a two-dimensional character kind of <laughs> I don't know what it is I just think that the, it's it would be easy to look at the lightness in this and think that it's an easy performance or it's an easier performance yeah but it's sort of like if Will Ferrell showed up showed up and played a character that was did all the Darren things but he seemed more like I don't know like he played it like Jim Carrey or he played it like another like a totally different comedian yeah. Then, like, Will Ferrell is playing Will Ferrell through this. Nicole Kidman is playing Samantha. Yeah, because Nicole Kidman Isabel. isn't like this in any other movie. Like, this is not... Right. This, this isn't just, like, I don't want to badmouth any actor. I'm not saying names, But there's, there's certain actors, they'll show up, and they'll just kind of be who you expect them to be in every movie. And it's like, this is the blah, blah, blah movie, and this is how they'll be. And this is kind of Nicole Kidman doing that sort of role. But we know that's not how she normally is, ever. So, and I don't think this is how Nicole Kidman is in real life, even though I read that Nora Ephron said this is the closest to how she is in real life. But I mean, she's doing an accent. The character's not Australian. Yeah. And right. and she's kind of playing this version of like, I am the person you would meet cute in a bookstore. Like, I am the one who would go to Bed Bath & Beyond. I am the one who's going to wiggle their nose. Like, she's playing a role that's in a way also kind of playing in this meta thing of but I'm playing the role that you would expect in this type of show or movie. And that's how I'm going to play this character. And it might seem totally like, Oh, it's just Nicole Kidman showing up, but we know that's not true. <laughs> this is her really acting. 
<laughs> you know, to play that kind of character that just seems like a normal person that's showing up in a big movie or whatever. I, it's like, it's so mad. I don't even know how to put it in words and make sense, but like, you are totally right. It's like, that's not how her hair looks. This is not how she talks. This is not, it looks so easy, but it's like, it'd be like saying that you think that like Denzel Washington must have it easy in some of his movies where he just seems like a very relaxed, normal you know guy. And you're like, well, no, but that's still acting, you know, like, <laughs> like it's all act. Like it's like, you, you know, when the ones that just show up, they're usually not actors. They're usually like something else. And they're in a movie to, you know, like when Jared showed up in Jack and Jill, the subway guy, He's just being himself and showing up to make some money. <laughs> Nicole Kidman here is acting. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, I mean, and it's not even a put down. Like some people, that's their style of acting is we want, like Jason Schwartzman in this. Yeah. Jason Schwartzman never gets, like sometimes he does character work, but even his character work, he doesn't get that far away from Jason Schwartzman. And that's fine because I really like Jason Schwartzman and, you know, not everyone, like I don't want every, not a lot of actors can do what Nicole Kidman does. Yeah. You know, she is in that Alec Guinness, Peter Sellers, shapeshifter kind of yeah. performer that, you know, or, you know, there's there's plenty of other people we could think of who are like that, but there are also plenty of others who are great and aren't like that. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I feel like that's one of those things you could watch this film. And if you're not thinking about, if you're not thinking about it, you might think that this is uh, Nicole Kidman giving a naturalistic performance as opposed to a just as crafted and created an artificial performance that you believe as she did in the hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, we haven't talked about Stephen Carell. Oh, uh, actually, we should talk about this. So then there there are these cameos. So Aunt Clara shows up with her <laughs> bag full of doorknobs to teach Nicole Kidman a lesson in witchery that goes wrong. She's played by Carol Shelley, who people might recognize as one of the Pigeon Sisters from The Odd Couple. You remember the Pigeon Sisters, the the two good time gals who would come and try and get Felix and Oscar to come out and have fun, but they'd always end up having a fight. Yeah. And then the appearance of Steve Carell as uncle Arthur, which is one of I, I, the movie knows that this is one of its big moments. Yeah. <laughs> and like Steve, Steve, seeing Steve Carell do Paul Lind doing uncle Arthur. It's so, it's so over the top. But it totally works. It doesn't take you out of the movie. It's like really funny. And of course, Carell and Farrell have a great, you know, have great chemistry for like from Anchorman and stuff. So like those scenes are very funny. And he and Steve Carell's having a great time. And it made me kind of wish that he was doing this kind of comedy again, because Steve Carell now kind of plays it a little more relaxed. And I like I like it when he's doing these kind of ridiculous over the top characters, like doing a Paul Lind impersonation. <laughs> and it totally works. So you started this off by saying that this film has three Oscar winners. Do you think that pretty soon we'll, at, like, at some point in the next five to ten years... Steve Carell? You know, I think Steve yeah. Carell will be added to that. I, he has, he's going to win an Oscar I sometime. Agree. And then we get... My favorite uh, little bit of, of cameos was you get Amy Sedaris and Richard And Richard Kind, kind playing a, the Kravitzes. Playing the Kravitzes. <laughs> and they were on the show of Bewitch. They were sort of the neighbors that had to be nosy and deal with... Uh, but I don't you just want to see any show where Amy Sedaris is married to Richard Kind and that's oh. I want to see that movie I want to see that TV show. Yeah, that I, was a really that was a that was a <laughs> sort of a mean teaser. It's like we could have had this through the whole I love both of them so much and like that would just be the best. And so did you so I told you that there's this weird trivia for this movie, this weird synchronicity thing that you would like. So the house that they shot in uh was a house that Nora Ephron remembers when she was a kid or whatever. And she's like, I like that house. I want to shoot in that house for where Nicole Kidman uh, buys the house and walks around and lives in. And then she found out after making this movie that that house and the person that she interacted with as a younger person didn't realize it was the actress who played Mrs. Kravitz on Bewitched. But she didn't know that until after this movie was done. I was like, well, that was, that was a house owned by the lady in the show. Isn't that weird? <laughs> she bought the Kravitz house. The Kravitz That's... house. Um, 
That's wild. That's wild. Oh, and we also, there's another actor who shows up in this. So there's a, a wonderful little bit where, so Michael Caine, whenever he tries to hit on a young woman, uh, Shirley MacLaine's and Dora makes that young woman say something that totally either rebuffs or turns <laughs> off, like, I have chlamydia or yeah. something like that. <laughs> and one of these young actresses, one of these young women that he's going to hit on is played by the great Kate Walsh, who was, I guess, not a star at the time because she's pretty much just a, has a co-star role. But she's gone on to many, many great things. And she was also a guest on uh, Radio 8 Ball. And I'll, I'll include a link to that in the show notes if you want to check it out. And if you're not familiar with Kate Walsh, she should be because she is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, <laughs> this is a, this is a really good movie. Yeah, it is, it's the kind of good movie that they don't make so much anymore. It's just like it's a delightful comedy that's totally inoffensive, but smart and it's full of funny people. And this is like the type of movie that like if it was like a holiday and I was hanging out with my family and this came on, we would just we watch it. We would love it all together. Like we'd all think this was great. Like, like this is a movie that people should not run away from, but embrace and actually check out. And it's it's actually not terribly hard to find. Uh, just I think I saw, found it on uh, I don't even remember, but it's it's online. I think it's on Crackle, but uh, it's great and it's just sad that it's had kind of it's it not just didn't just have a bad rap, but also just been completely forgotten about. Like this movie is just totally erased from people's minds. Like it's just not even a thing that anyone considers to hate. It's just not even there. <laughs> and so like find it, watch it. Uh. Yeah, it's. I think it's just one of those movies that just got bad reviews at the time, and like you said, I think the like it, what type of movie that was like, maybe we saw the trailer too many times before some movies that summer, and then we all just moved on and thought we watched it or had no interest. Um, oh, and one more thing: our not good friends, the Raspberry Awards, of course, guy gave this movie numerous <laughs> nominations. Worst actor, Will Ferrell. Worst director, Nora Ephron. Worst screenplay. It actually won a Raspberry Award for worst screen couple. Between Fuck Will, you. Between Fuck Will... you, Raspberries. <laughs> I hate you. I'm sorry. I, we want to be positive, but I want to get in between the targets of your abuse and you and say, fuck you. You're the worst. You're the worst. <laughs> Yeah, Will Ferrell and Nick Nicole Kim and worst screen couple. Like, there's they they have actual chemistry. It shouldn't work because Nicole Kim is so much better than Will Ferrell as an actor. No diss to Will Ferrell, but it's just true. He's more of a comedian. She's more of an actor, but it works. They're really good and they really play off each other well and they play to each other's strengths very well. And to say this movie is worst director is crazy. There's no level of incompetence to the filmmaking here whatsoever. Zero. Yeah. Like this is a well-made movie. It's maybe sure it's not some big Oscar movie, but for this type of movie, for like just a good Hollywood comedy, it's solid. Like Nora Ephron is an actual filmmaker and she does a very good job. And the script is witty as hell. And it's so funny. And just the thing you said about like how it references that there were two Darren's by the way it rewound like that's so cl that is actual great screenwriting that is very clever and done that's so smart and so just to be dismissive and be like and like I bet they didn't watch the movie I bet the Raspberry Awards were just like oh that just looks like some shit haha <laughs> it's based on some uh tv show oh the movie didn't do well okay well let's like you know like prod it and poke it with a spear and kick it <laughs> kick it in the ground <laughs> yeah give me a break <laughs> they should be sued by the raspberry lobby for defamation of fruit of berries. I, know. I mean, they give they it's one of the better berries and they they they're just they they're making me have a bad association with a berry that I love. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I feel like every few months we're going to constantly be like and the raspberry said this movie's garbage. So if we're ever out of ideas for movies that are good, if you in life <laughs> just look at what the Raspberry Awards nominated, and those movies will actually be better than most movies that you didn't, you know, that you didn't see yet. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, you know what? Okay. <laughs> are you are you crying? No. Are you crying? No. 
it sounds like you're crying. No, actually, yeah. I just ate some Silk City hot sauce. What? Yeah. What, why did that make you cry? Because it's so spicy. It's I just had the hot experiment, Mysteries of the Habanero, revealed. It's very hot. Very <laughs> spicy. You Whoa. T- you, t- you know, you too can have some Silk City hot sauce. Really? Yeah. And actually, if you go to SilkCityHotSauce.com and type in the promo code WORLD, you can get 15% off some Silk City hot sauce. Ow, Sammy. Did I do it right? Did I do it? <laughs> that was that was very that was very that was a very graceful transition. Yeah, so cr- now uh <laughs> while our listeners are trying to like screw their heads back on because they thought we were going one place and we we, we zagged when they thought we would zig. Let's uh let's play a PSA or let's play a promo for one of our fellow paper house uh, compatriot podcasters and uh then we'll come back. He's Steve Lippman. And she's Candy Claire. And together we figure it out. out. Join us as we take on life's unanswered or overly answered questions. Our guests include comedians, healers, environmentalists, Bake Off contestants, and some nonsense from our beloved intern Dine. You can send us questions and hear them answered live on the podcast. A new episode every or every other Wednesday on Paper House Network. Okay, well, when we're not doing The World is Wrong podcast, you also host a podcast that we talk about a lot on this show called The Director's Wall with your co-host, AJ Gonzalez. And in this season of The Director's Wall, you are going through the films of Francis Ford Coppola. And considering the love that you've expressed here for Nora Ephron, I guess we can assume that season three will be <laughs> devoted to the films of Nora Ephron. You know, I really am heavily considering it. It's like, because I like what I like about Coppola is we're also covering movies that he wrote or you know maybe ghost directed. And like, what's good about Nora Ephron is you also have her. We could tie in like what she wrote for other people and the movies she wrote and directed herself. So like, that's a whole nice little world. And it's not a lot of movies either, so I think we very easily nail that in a year. And I also like the idea of kind of seriously considering all of her movies, which a lot of people tend to not think about as much. I think when you make a lot of movies that are so successful, people tend to maybe not take you as seriously till long, long after you're dead, <laughs> if you are lucky. <laughs> and I feel like I want to celebrate her films. Like she is so good. To, like I think she's one of the best writers like man it's just yeah i will definitely and i've never seen i never saw julie and julia i want to see that the julia child oh yeah movie. that's good i bet that's good um so yeah there's, there's definitely some holes that there's some blind spots but then there's also stuff that I, i've never seen silkwood either oh my goodness yeah so I, I need to that one of her not funny movies <laughs> That's a great. That was her. That was her first uh, yeah. first screenplay. Yeah. And we didn't mention with heartburn, but that's based upon her actual life. She was married to Carl Bernstein, uh, yeah. who was the Woodward. Who was part of the Woodward and Bernstein, uh, all the president's men, duo. And obviously, he's gone on to write many uh, to be one of the you know I don't want to say greatest, but one of the most famous political jour- journalists of his time. But uh, at least in Heartburn, it sounds like he wasn't that great to be married to. <laughs> you know, not everyone is. <laughs> yeah, doesn't I certainly mean, wasn't. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. <laughs> it just means it didn't work. It's fine. Right. Uh, <laughs> also, curiously, she uh, she wrote and directed Michael, which we talked about earlier because that was based upon uh, Pete Dexter novel, and he was the guy who wrote The Paperboy. You know, so I, that's a, it's, a by the there. end of this podcast uh, run, everyone will know exactly where what movies we like. It's like we keep coming back to the same world, the same group of people, just without even thinking about it. Just all this keeps coming back. It's amazing. <laughs> and I feel like you must have seen Mixed Nuts. That seems oh, like yeah. it's ah, one of that's your Adam Sandler, Steve Martin. That movie's great. I, I'm a fan of that movie. Another movie that a lot of people hate. That is, yeah. is actually very good. So you and 
Wait, wait. We okay. should also mention that when we're talking about Nora Ephron, we should all she collaborates a lot with her sister Delia. Yeah, and uh, so it just feels like she should be included in this. Like she co she worked on the screenplay for Mix Nuts and for Michael and for mm-hmm. You Got Mail and for Bewitched, and worked as a producer on Sleepless in Seattle and You've Got Mail and try to think of other. You know, we have the Cohen brothers and we have the Ephrons. Are there any other? Sibling duos that are worth giving shout outs to. I mean, the, the Safety Brothers. The Wachowski obviously. sisters. Yes. Uh, the Safety Brothers. Um, for, you know, f- sibling filmmaking teams. It's a, it's a good thing. There's my friends, the Zellner brothers, who make great movies. Um, keep it in the family. If, you know, if you're both talented, just work together. Why not? Do you have any, do you have any siblings? I do, and I don't do anything with them. (laughs) Yeah, I would find it very hard to, like, I feel like that's like one of those things where either if you're the kind of siblings that work together, then you're like that from, you must be like that from from the beginning. From day one, yeah. I mean, in a a way, that's who Zach is, who's going to be doing the other Nicole Kidman episodes with you. Like, he has always been, like, uh, you know, brother to me. Like, I've known him since I was a kid. So, like, that... I would count that. I think him and I have been doing stuff since I was 16, making projects together. So that I, I count that the Carlson Connolly brothers. Yeah. Which one, of, if you had to take, <laughs> if one of you had to take the other one's name, would you rather be, do you think you'd rather be Brian Carlson or make him Zach Connolly? Zach Connolly seems like not a real name. Like I don't want the last name Carlson, but a Brian Carlson works more than a Zach Connolly. Zachariah Connolly just doesn't really <laughs> doesn't really make sense. But <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah. I think we'd just do okay. a, I would do a hyphen thing. I think that's what I would be a Carlson Connolly probably. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> this is a Carlson Connolly joint. You know, it's nice. Look at you putting your putting your bro ahead of you. Aren't you? You're like the opposite of Will Ferrell in this film. <laughs> You're the guy, you're like, you walk around through life as, as if you're the Will Ferrell who's constantly in love with your, with your co-star who's overshadowing you. You're like, so you also have another show called the Radio 8 Ball Show, where you answer questions by picking songs at random. And so did you have, have you had anyone on Radio 8 Ball that was in Bewitched? Well, I didn't, like I just, of... I told you, Kate Walsh, who uh, Michael Caine tried to come on to in that <laughs> uh, restaurant or party scene or whatever it is when she's serving the shrimp or crab thing or whatever she's serving and Michael Caine comes on to her like a creepy old man and then Shirley MacLaine shuts it down. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And she was a guest on Radio 8 Ball about a year and a half ago. Uh, oh. Yeah, and I was thinking I'm just going to I want to play her question and the answer she got from Anya Marina who is her friend who invited her on the show. I just put it on in here as like a little bonus content. What do you think about that? That's great. Excellent. And then when it's over, we'll come back and let you know the things you need to know about the next show and all that stuff. Time passes. In Anya Marina, independent woman, what, what, uh, tell, tell Kate listeners. Walsh, Kate Walsh plays my friend, and um, I have a bit of a problem, and I rush over to her home to get her help. And uh, she's very irritated with me because I'm, I play a very self-centered version of me. And she's busy with a gentleman caller in her apartment. And I don't want to spoil it for you, but I will say that um, we didn't have to pay for hair and makeup and because Kate and or wardrobe because Kate's just naturally gorgeous and she just plays herself waking up in the morning in uh, in her lovely apartment. And uh, she's just wrapped up in a sheet. So I don't want to give it away too much, Kate. Right? No. That's, that's like a good yeah, answer. No. Yeah, I think that uh, it was really fun to do. And also, we did it at my apartment, so it couldn't have been easier. <laughs> and uh, we, yeah, we had um, a really fun time, if I do say so myself. But the script was really funny. And Kate we just, wrote it. Yeah. Kate helped co write the episode and had a great idea and kind of reworked the whole thing. And uh, Jonathan Sosis, our director, and Bethany, our producer, were very. Um, accommodating and helpful and it was such a fun episode kate's hilarious and uh who's the dude in bed with you in that scene 
Well, he's a fantastic actor, um, and he's Kate like specific wanted a specific look, so we picked him, and he's just gorgeous. And his name is escaping <laughs> me right now, and I will think of it. Ben. <laughs> Nope, not Ben. It's I will think of Leo, 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 Leo Solomon. He's so cute. He Kate, how much of your actual body did he see? Not a lot, because I had like a well, I think I had like a bra folded down. He may have I don't know. <laughs> he may have seen the midsection, which is not my strongest, but you know. Um, the most yeah, of the scene is done legs, in bed. Maybe. We yeah. had, and then I will say my cat Pablo made an appearance. It's like he was waiting his whole life to be in this show. Yeah. Um, who knew? Um, maybe we should be asking Pablo questions on your on your program because <laughs> it's as if he knew. He's like, this is going to be special, and I've waited for a good 13 years to be on on your independent independent. Woman. We actually Taft Hartley'd Pablo, so he got his we SAG did. card. So he's now a working cat. A working cat actor, and (laughs) and this this uh, this segment this uh, episode featured. uh, Now, Anya, you had a a a very uh, a pernicious little rash in your midsection. Speaking of midsections, and uh, I was curious: is that was that a real rash or was that uh, was that makeup? It was real. No, no, that that was makeup. But you mean based on a true rash? Well, I was wondering if that was an actual... Well, I, it, it no, looked no, real. No, no, that was not... Thank you. No, it was good makeup, right? <laughs> yeah. Did yeah. you do that on you yourself? I did it with Bethany. We did it together. It's you a lip... You guys are so talented. It's a very expensive lipstick, I will say. It's like a $50 tube. But wow. it was worth it. You know it. what? Can we get reimbursed for that on your show? <laughs> Can we have somebody call in and just get that lipstick back? I'm going to send an invoice. <laughs> yeah, see if they'll endorse you. Yeah. Just see. We use Damn your lipstick it. to. It's it's the lipstick that looks like a rash. I love them, sell but a lot see this them. episode, episode three of Independent Woman. It's called "Is There a Doctor in the House?" And Kate Walsh is phenomenal in this episode. It was so I fun. I mean, it's powerful, really. <laughs> Some say spellbinding. Um, no, but it, it was really fun and funny. I think I think we are adorable together. You I'm are. Delightful. I I corroborate that. You are adorable together. We have fun. We have a good yeah, time. We do. We're a lady gang. Everyone wishes that they were either that guy or that cat. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I gotta say, I, I um, the, just go back to the rash situation because I, the, that, I'm, I guess I'm a kind of a fan of rash of like, or not just rash, but skin blemish cinema. Mm-hmm. I, when I was in high school, uh, How to Get Ahead in Advertising came out, the Richard E. Grant film where. Oh yeah, with the boils. With the yeah. boils, and I really thought this might go in that direction. Like maybe you'd birth a new Anya Marina out of the rash. Does that happen? No, spoiler alert. Does it's that happen later on? It's not a horror genre. It's okay. just a mockumentary about okay. a lady in New York. Okay. Okay. <laughs> just a singer-songwriter. That's your thing. Okay. You like horror. I, I don't, but I'm just in them. I, I do enjoy watching YouTube videos, though, of like popped cysts and stuff. So I do kind of really? get what you're talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, well. I guess uh, I guess that's a, a maybe that's a, a good segue. maybe a good segue into Kate Walsh's question for the Pop Oracle. Uh, what do you have for us, Kate? Well, I just want to know if I'm going to be doing an amazing play in New York or London this year. Ooh, I love that. Is there a particular amazing play that you want to be doing in New York or I London? No, but I just want to do an amazing play in New York or London. Okay, guys. Okay, so well. Let's ask the Oracle. Let's see. Okay. Will it happen in, will it happen in 2019 is my question. Or can we ask or 2020? Sure. Feels like, okay. All right. Let's see. Excellent. Well, yeah. now to engage the Pop Oracle on your behalf, I'm going to spin the Wheel of Eight. Na, 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 na. Wheel of Eight. Song, song number, number six. six. Oh. Which is, what is song number six? It's called Shut Up. <laughs> 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 Heard about you for a while, never saw a show. Used to play you on college radio. Now we're face to face, friend of a friend. 
got a hundred reasons why this shouldn't happen. You got a hundred reasons why this shouldn't be, and not a single one of them has a thing to do with me. So just shut up. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Kiss me like you mean it. Just shut up. Shut up, shut up, shut up. I'm a man, I'm a man with a plan. That's me in the broken window. He said, Don't you understand? You weren't even sure it was me when I walked in the room. Careful, son, it's gonna get real hot soon. And I've been, I've been trying to fight this fight right here by swimming upstream. I couldn't tell you where I'm going, couldn't show you where I've been. So just shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Kiss me like you mean it. Just shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. So just shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Kiss me like you mean it. Just shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Do you know the value of this? Can you assess it? And if you could, would you even know how to invest it? I know a thing about a thing or two. I know I gotta keep a couple things safe from you. If I folded my heart into a pretty paper plane. And flew it across the Hudson. Would it come back again? Would it get crumpled up? Would it get caught up in a crosswind in the sea? Or would it fly back to me? Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Kiss me like you mean it. Just shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And that was Shut Up from Ani I, Marina. I also just love that song. Well, that was the That's answer. It is a great song. That was the answer to the question you asked about whether or not you're going to be doing a fantastic play. I mean, there it is. The universe is spoken through Anya Marina, and it says, shut up. Well, I... <laughs> but also, kiss me, I give you a bit. You know what? I'll just take it to being like, be here now, girl. How about that? That's good. That's good. I have some ideas. Uh, Anya, you want to tell us a little bit about the background of that song and maybe how you I think love it that song. The background that? of the song is um, it's sort of like saying it's articulating all of my fears about a relationship and this person that I'm talking to is telling me all these reasons why this thing can't work out. But the song is very hopeful and it's saying like shut up shut up with all of your fears and all of your reasons and all of your logic for why this can't work and just shut up and go with your gut like go with your body go with your dreams the bridge which says like um but what if we just stop pretending stop making believe what if true love only comes when you're playing for keeps so it's like stop acting you like you want it and just like do it and go with what your gut is that your gut really wants this so just do it well that seems like that that aligns with with kate's interpretation i thought there were a couple of lines in there well first of all uh you talked about how you never saw a show and so oh, like right. there are probably a lot of kate walsh fans who would like to see her in a play do you do do you have you done other uh theater in new york or london before I've done theater in New York, yes. So I'm just waiting for the right piece to come along. But uh, yes, is the answer to that. And what yes. what was what was the last thing that you did on stage in New York? I did a play called If I Forget. It was so theater. good. It was about a Jewish family living in. Was it the '80s, Kate? It was when. No, it was oh. like right, it was right before um, George Bush uh, got reelected. W got elected and then right after so early yeah. 90s yeah it's right so 
9 so 11 era. Like the, uh, yeah, like during the falling yeah. Chad. During the fall, yeah. okay, hanging is, Chad. Hanging Chad. Before, Hang. <laughs> before 9 11 and after. Yeah. Right. And then there's also the line about there's a hundred reasons why. Oh, yeah. And you were in 13 reasons why. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, God. That's right. Crazy. So you got, is, you is got a hundred po- reasons why this shouldn't be, right. but not a single one of them has a thing to do with me. Oh, my God. You're right. Yeah. So is there, uh, is there a chance they, they, they would make 13 reasons why into a... In, it seems like that might actually work as a theatrical piece. I don't think so. I don't think that. I'm not saying I don't. I, I disagree with you, but no, I, there are no plans to make that. Yeah, but I'm sure theatrical piece. they no, make so I, many. And I think that's probably not going to happen. You know, say. you'd think that, but then they made Footloose, and they made you know, there's so many things that get made into plays yeah, at knows? this point. I guess anything's possible. It's a musical, Kate. <laughs> it's oh my be... god. <laughs> It's going to be dark. It's going to be dark. A dark musical. No, no, I think I think this is speaking to Kate's subconscious or or any of our subconscious fears about a dream but, but like all of the well, logical the reasons happened, why it might not. The dream is it no longer the dream. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, here's uh, here's the 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 question I have for you. So if so this is the, when you listen to this, do you feel Kate like you're the guy in it? who is sort of hemming and hawing and she's singing to saying, shut up? Or do you relate more to the singer as the one saying, shut up and kiss me? Probably I relate more to the singer, absolutely. Yeah, so it's sort of like you're sort of saying to the theatrical world, you know, stop hemming and hawing, I'm available. Kiss me like you mean it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Shit, right. Guys, I'm learning a lot. Growing, learning, I'm expanding oh, that's, this program. Oh, that makes me that makes me very proud. Makes me very yeah. proud. Time passes. <laughs> All right. So, what is our next episode? We're going to be exploring the 2006 film *Fur*, an imaginary portrait of Diane Arbus, starring Nicole Kidman and Robert Downey Jr., and directed by Steven Shainberg. A director who directed me in a film, his student film at the American Film Institute, and that led to being able to get him as an interview subject for that episode. So when we get into it, not only will we be sharing our thoughts on this great film, but we'll also be getting the insights from the director. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And if you'd like to share your thoughts or comments or reactions to anything we've said on this podcast, you can reach out to us at contact at the world is wrong podcast.com. You can also find us at the world is wrong podcast on Instagram. And yeah, this is uh this has been great, Brian. Yeah. I feel good about it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Yeah. Let's hope that uh, you think that doing this, if there are real witches, do you feel like championing this film will get us in their good graces? I think so. Yeah. It's like we're on the right side of history with this one. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And if you're not on the right side of history, well, there's room for you. You can still you can still come over and enjoy this film. But I guess this is the point where I just got to remind you, as I always do, that Well, wherever you are, the world is wrong. And it's probably wrong about you. There's no way. Okay, okay, if you insist. Uh, ah, It was last June, and uh, I actually uh, cast this witch as a witch, and now brooms make me cry. I can't sleep, and I don't know what's real or what's the TV show. Heidi Ho! No! Look what the cat dragged in. Somebody is retaining water. Uncle Arthur, it's you. Oh, no, you're going to crack the mirror, aren't you? Oh, you watch too much television. I know you're going to do what you always do. Don't be silly. Come closer. Do I have something in my teeth right there? Where? Look. (laughs) 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 That was fun. Where's Sammy? Where's my Sammy? Andros here. When I'm not 
co-hosting the World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Show. 